Stephanie Huff and I am recording um, a concept on intracranial regulation. So first of all, intracranial regulation refers to the processes that affect intracranial compensation and adaptive neurologic function. The neurologic system regulates and integrates all body functions, muscle movements, mental abilities, and emotions. It collects sensory input from internal and external environments. It processes and, and, and interprets the input and causes responses that are manifested as motor or sensory output. Normal intracranial regulation. In the neurologic system, it is divided into two principal parts, the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which includes the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. Neurons are basic cells of the nervous system. They are specialized cells that send impulses throughout the body. The myelin sheath covers larger and longer nerves and helps speed the rate of the nerve impulses. White matter is also part of the nervous system. Looking at the central nervous system, the brain is the control center of the nervous system and it is protected by three connective tissue membranes known as meninges. These help to nourish the central nervous system. The cerebral spinal fluid cushions the brain and prevents injury to the brain tissue. The skull is a bony structure that protects the brain. The brain has four um, parts. The first one is the, cerebr the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the brain. It is composed of gray matter and has two hemisp hemispheres that are divided into four regions known as lobes. The frontal lobe is involved with speech, thought, learning, emotion, and voluntary movement. The prefrontal cortex of the frontal lobe controls complicated cognitive processes and judgments, reasoning, and concern for others. The parietal lobe um, processes all sensory information, including shapes, temperature, pain, two-point discrimination, and hot versus cold. The occipital lobe processes vision. This is also where the visual cortex is lo located. The temporal lobe stores memory and interprets auditory stimuli. The olfactory cortex is also located in the temporal lobe, lobe and it interprets smell. The second part is the diencephalon and it consists of the thalamus which is the relay center for all signals coming into the brain. It takes all the signals and sends them to the correct region of the, of the brain. It is also known as the gateway to the cerebral cortex. It also includes the hypothalamus which is the autonomic control center. It controls many of your bodily functions, including heart rate, blood pressure, respirations, um, the rate and depth of them, pain and pleasure, fear. It also controls body temperature, food and water intake and balance. It helps control mood and sleep cycles and digestive motility. It also includes the epithalamus. The third part is the cerebellum, which is the second largest part of the brain. It is located below the, cere um, the cerebrum behind the brain stem. It um, is made up of gray and white matter. It is res responsible for muscle movement, balance, and control. It coordinates stimuli from the cerebral cortex, transmitting information needed for skeletal muscle coordination and smooth movements. The brain stem is the fourth area, and it controls reflexes and influences all basic life functions, including breathing, blood pressure, and heart rate. It also regulates vomiting, hiccuping, coughing, and sneezing. It contains the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. It will connect pathways in the brain. 
Um, Ten of the twelve pairs of cranial nerves originate here. Influences um, blood pressure by controlling vasodilation. It regulates respiratory rate, depth, and rhythm. Um, the location of the reticular formation, um, which contains neurons that integrate sensory information from the peripheral nervous system and relays information to the cerebral cortex. And this is um, also located in the brain stem. The upper part of the reticular formation consists of a network of fibers called the um, RAS, or the reticular activating system, and this is involved in the sleep-wake cycle. The spinal cord is an extension of the brain stem, um, specifically um, of the medulla oblongata. It passes through the skull. It is protected by the meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and bony vertebrae. It transmit, transmits impulses to and from the brain. Looking at the peripheral nervous system, cranial um, nerves, there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The first two pairs originate in the anterior brain and the remaining 10 originate in the brain stem. The vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, is the only one that serves um, the body regions below the neck. The, each nerve can be sensory, motor, or mixed, which means they're both sensory and motor. Um, on page 689 of your book, there's table 11-1, and it talks about the different cranial nerves, what number they are, what their names are, and what um, they control. Spinal nerves, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Um, and they are named by their location. And so you have eight pairs of cervical nerves, 12 pair of thoracic, five pair of lumbar, five pair of sacral, and one pair of um, coccygeal nerves. All um, your spinal nerves produce both motor and sensory activity. Each nerve is responsible for a different area of body and has, specific, has a specific function. Dermatones. Um, all spinal nerves except C1 serve as um, a cutaneous region, and so that's just um, the body is divided up into dermatones, and so this is what they are controlled. Uh, reflexes are rapid, involuntary, predictable motor responses to stimuli. There's um, somatic reflexes, which result in skeletal muscle contraction, and autonomic reflexes that activate cardiac muscle and smooth muscles and glands. Looking at genetic and lifespan consideration, um, growth is rapid during the fetal period. Um, neonate has primitive reflexes at birth. These include sucking the Babinski sign, stretch um, receptors, startle, which is the Moreau reflex, um, rooting, um, stepping reflex. There's also the grasp reflex. Um, by the end of the first month, all of the um, primitive reflexes have disappeared except for the Babinski, which is normal through the age of two. If it is present after the age of two, then this could indicate a cerebral damage. And then that's a picture of how to assess the Babinski's reflex. All right, the cry of a newborn. If it's shrill, cat-like cry, or weakened or absent cry, that could um, lead you to believe that there is some kind of neurologic um, problem going on. Need to measure the head circumference. Um, they measure it first to get a baseline when they're first born, um, and then this is continued to see if there's any um, like increased intracranial pressure. Um, also need to assess um, the child's spine and gross motor skills. The anterior fontanelle will remain open for about a year. The posterior fontanelle closes at about two months of age. Looking at the aging process, um, slow, subtle, and steady decreases in neurologic function occur with the aging process. Um, these are things like memory loss, subtleness, um, or subtle loss of coordination. They may have slower or diminished reflexes. Their senses are usually not as acute, um, and their muscle mass will decrease. 
alterations to intracranial regulation. These usually occur due to illness or injury. Uh, you need to assess the pattern of manifestations. This will help determine the extent of cerebral dysfunction. It usually follows a predictable progression that is um, higher functions um, impaired initially with progressing to primi primitive functions um, that will impair later on. Early manifestations are altered level of consciousness and behavioral changes. The progression of um, deteriorating brain function will also occur um, as the um, manifestations get worse and the longer this goes on. So looking at the progression of deteriorating brain function, um, at first the patient is alert, oriented to time, place, and person. Then as things progress, they will respond to verbal stimuli, um, shows decreased concentration, agitation, confusion, lethargy. Um, they're usually um, very disoriented. They may have the presence of doll's eyes, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Then it progresses on to that they require continuous stimulation to arouse them. Um, during this stage, they can have decorticate posturing and Cheyenne Stokes respirations, and we'll talk about um, posturing here in just a second, too. Um, the next time, it displays reflexive positioning to pain, um, painful stimuli. Usually, the pupils are fixed, and they will develop decerebate posturing. Then it will progress down to shows no response to stimuli. Um, they may have gasping respirations, apnea, fixed pupils. They may be flaccid. All right, so this is looking at assessment of eye movements. You have the oculocephalic reflex, which is doll's eyes, and you also have the oculovestibular reflex, which is known as the cold caloric test. So looking at doll's eyes, um, first you have to make sure that they do not have a cervical injury before performing this. Um, this is has to be done on an unconscious patient only. It cannot be done on a conscious patient or you will get um, false readings. So basically you have the um, patient is laying on their back in the supine position and you will um, turn their head to one side briskly and if the eyes deviate to the opposite direction that the head is turned then this is a normal response and this says that doll's eyes are present. So basically this is how you do it. Unconscious patient only. Hold the eyes open. Briskly turn their head from side to side. If the eyes move in the opposite direction, the head is turned, then the patient has a positive doll's eyes, and that's normal. If they stay fixed at the midline, um, this is negative, and make sure that you do not perform this on a patient with a cervical fracture. All right, so this is just kind of showing you how um, it goes, and so you can see how it says doll's eyes present, and so basically they go in the opposite directions. If they stay fixed or midline, then that is an absent reflex, so doll's eyes are absent. Okay, and so this is looking at um, the abnormal response. And this is just showing you in the real world how it's done. And so this one, you can see the eyes stay midline, and so this is doll's eyes absent, so this is a bad abnormal response. Okay, the oculovestibular reflex are also called the cold caloric test. It is performed by a physician only, and it's usually the final um, clinical assessment of brainstem function. And so basically what they're doing is they're injecting cold ice water into the ear, and they're watching for um, nystagmus of the eyes or deviation of the eyes um, toward the affected ear. So if you have nystagmus toward the irrigated ear, this is a normal finding. And so you can see that in A. Um, abnormal would be a discongenent eye movement or no response. So if they stay midline or if they deviate to the opposite ear, then that's an abnormal response. 
All right, so this is your decorder kit posturing. And so the um, lower extremities are going to be extended and internally rotated. The upper extremities are going to be flexed and um, curled up. And decorder kit, you can remember that because it's toward the cord. And so the arms are um, flexed toward the cord. So that's your decorder kit posturing. Decerebrate posturing is worse than decorticate posturing. It means that we're having some progression and deterioration. So the upper extremities are now extended and rotated externally outward, so they're away from the cord. Just remember decorticate is co toward the cord, and decerebrate is away from the cord. All right, so concepts related to intracranial regulation. You have your acid-base balance, um, respiratory acidosis, um, occurs with increased CO2, um, which leads to vasodilation, which will lead to increased intracranial pressure. Oxygenation um, needs to be assessed. Decreased level of consciousness can result in uh, decreased respirations. Comfort, um, this is looking at more the end of life care. Um, increased intracranial pressure can lead to herniation, which, which can lead to brain death. And so then basically you're just kind of making them comfortable. Cognition um, involves mental assessment. Um, confusion can be mild to lack of um, consciousness. Looking at alterations in their level of consciousness. Consciousness is a condition in which individual is aware of their self and the environment. They are able to respond appropriately to stimuli. Arousal or alertness depends on the reticular activating system being intact and working like it's supposed to. Cognition is a complex process by which individuals learn, store, retrieve, and use information. Arousal and cognition depend on normal physiologic function. So looking at alterations um, continued conditions, Consciousness is a dynamic state. It may be altered by the processes that affect arousal. Your major causes of alterations in level of consciousness include lesions or injuries that compress or destroy the neurons of the reticular activating uh, system, metabolic disorders, and medications. Brain function depends on continuous blood flow with unimpended um, supplies of oxygen and glucose. Some of the processes that disrupt this flow and cause damage are going to be global ischemia and hypoglycemia, which are your main causes of alterations in level of consciousness. You can also have localized masses that can also affect their level of consciousness. So some of the disorders that affect LOC, um, these are the processes that may destroy or compress neurologic structures. You have increased intracranial pressure, cerebral infarction, which are your strokes, hematomas, hydrocephalus, intracranial hemorrhage, tumors, infections, injury from excitatory amino acids, and demyelinating disorders. So basically, any condition that affects the delivery of blood, oxygen, or glucose to the brain may also alter the um, level of consciousness. If cerebral blood flow is impaired or if the patient becomes hypoxic or hypoglycemic, cerebral metabolism is impaired and level of consciousness declines very rapidly. Some of your other metabolic alterations are going to be fluid and electrolyte imbalances, specifically hyponatremia because that can cause um, changes in level of consciousness. Acid-base imbalances like hypercapnia, so increased CO2 levels. Accumulation of waste products from the liver or renal failure. Uh, drugs that suppress the central nervous system include alcohol, analgesics, and anesthetics. Severe hypoxia can lead to ischemia this can be local after a stroke, or it could be global um, from cardiac arrest or hypovolemic shock. So your normal intracranial pressure 
For infants, it's 1.5 to 6 millimeters per mercury. Children is 3 to 7 millimeters per mercury, and adults is 5 to 15 millimeters per mercury. Um, Increased intracranial pressure is sustained elevated pressures of 15 millimeters of mercury or higher in adults. ICPs of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury warrant, is going to warrant immediate interventions because we need to get that pressure down. Seizures, which we've already talked about, remember these are periods of abnormal electrical discharges in the brain that can cause involuntary movement and or behaviors. It also has sensory alterations, and seizures commonly affect level of consciousness. So outcomes of altered level of consciousness. Full recovery with no uh, long-term residual effects. They can have recovery with some residual damage. Um, more severe consequences are going to be your persistent vegetative state, which is an irreversible coma. This is what Terry Shadow had. Um, this is a permanent condition of complete unawareness of their self and environment. They have loss of all cognitive functions. Their sleep-wake cycle is intact. They can chew, swallow, and cough, but there is no interaction with the environment. Um, sometimes they may track their eyes around the room, but they're not really focusing um, and cannot follow any commands. Locked-in syndrome is when the patient is fully alert and aware of their environment and has the cognitive ability, but they are unable to communicate through speech or movement um, because basically they are just paralyzed. And motor paralysis um, affects all voluntary muscles. Um, some of your cranial nerves, like one through four, may remain intact, allowing them communication through eye movement with like eye blinks for yes or no. Um, but basically, they are fully aware of everything that's going on. They just can't move or respond. Brain death is cessation and irreversibility of all brain functions, including brain stem. Uh, recognized criteria for brain death includes unresponsive, coma with absent motor and reflex movements, apnea, so no spontaneous respirations, pupils that are fixed and dilated, they have absent ocular responses to head turning and caloric stimulation. So that's the cold caloric test and the doll's eyes test that we just talked about. Their EEG is flat, so there's no electrical activity in the brain at all. They have persistent um, of manifestations for 30 minutes to one hour, um, indicates brain death, um, and for six hours after the onset of coma and apnea they are considered brain dead. Prognosis varies according to the underlying cause and the pathologic processes going on. Age does play a role. Uh, young adults may fully recover from a deep um, coma from head injury, drug overdoses, or other causes. Um, the condition um, also plays a role. So looking at their overall health before their injury or whatever happened also, um, looking at the recovery, um, if recovery occurs within two weeks, then there's usually a favorable outcome. The longer that somebody is in a coma, usually the worse off the prognosis is. Um, it is poor for clients who lack pupillary reaction or re reflex eye movement six hours after the onset of coma. Looking at prevalence, um, disease processes or trauma affect 1.7 million traumatic brain injuries per year in the United States. Your adolescents and older adults are going to be most vulnerable. Males are usually at higher risk. And then falls are going to be a leading cause. In prevention, neurologic damage usually occurs after a traumatic event. So it's important of wearing protective equipment such as helmets during sport activities, um, bicycling, skateboarding, um, anything that you're doing where there's a chance that you could hit your head, you need to have a helmet on. Um, and then fall prevention for older adults, making sure that um, things that we've talked about before, as far as loose um, throw rugs in the house, um, wiring extension cords out in the mobile floor, um, objects in their way, different things like that.
Um, looking at the assessment, assessment um, needs to be done to determine their neurologic status. It may be part of the health screen screening. It may um, focus on their chief complaint, such as if they've had a headache, or it may be part of a total health assessment. Looking at the nursing assessment, it's going to focus on their chief complaint. If their level of consciousness is altered, you may have to rely on family members to gather information as far as what's going on with them. Um, the use of the Glasgow Coma Scale, this assesses level of consciousness only. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Some of your developmental considerations. For your infants and children, you need to consider their developmental age um, but as part of the assessment. For older adults, they may tire more easily and need um, rest breaks, so their assessment may take a little longer. All right, so this is looking at the Glasgow Coma Scale. Like I said, it's for level of consciousness only. It is not considered a complete neurologic exam. It evaluates three categories, eye opening, verbal response, and motor response. So the best score you can have is 15. The lowest score is 3. And so basically that's just getting your minimal or no responses. And that is a 3. So basically you, any of your inanimate objects, you know, tables, trees, whatever, could be a 3. Um, anything less than 7 generally indicates a coma state. Changes in Glasgow coma are often trigger for critical intervention. So that's why they need to be um, monitoring these very frequently. Um, it is not a valid measure and must not be used for children and that's usually because they may not be able to follow commands. Your intoxicated patients um, will fail this Glasgow Coma Scale miserably. Um, patients that have spinal cord injury because like maybe they're paralyzed, they're not going to be able to move their extremities so they're going to get um, lower scores on their um, motor movements and sometimes they may have issues with sensory um, stimuli as well. So this is basically how it's scored for eye opening. Um, spontaneously you get a 4. If you don't get anything then you get a 1. Verbal response, if they're oriented they get a 5 um, and then it goes all the way down to no response and they get a 1. Motor response, the same thing. If they obey commands they get a 6. If they don't have any kind of um, response, they get a 1. And so you can kind of see how they have withdrawal from pain, localizes to pain, flexion, extension, that kind of thing. And so basically, you just kind of give them the score, and then you add up your numbers, and then that's what your Glasgow Coma Scale is. Um, also, it doesn't account for your patients that are intubated or if they're aphasic so that they can't speak. Alright, so nursing assessment um, continued. Looking at the assessment interview, um, just asking general questions. Um, have they ever had a diagnosis of some type of neurological illness? Um, any infections or injuries? You need to know if they've had any fainting episodes or seizures. Have they had any changes in their vision, hearing or smelling? Changes in balance or coordination? pain or any changes in memory and then all of these are going to be um, specific to infants, children and pregnant females as well. So some of your um, assessments may be a little bit altered. Alright, so we kind of talked about um, pain and behaviors. Um, the environment needs to be nice and calm and quiet without any distractions. The older adult, we talked about, they may need a little bit more time and um, some um, little rest breaks in between um, assessments. So your um, neurologic assessment is going to focus on your mental status, cranial nerves, which um, pages 698 through 705 of your book shows um, the neurologic assessment and how it's done and also shows all of your 12 cranial nerves and how to assess those. So that would might be something good for you to look over. It also invol involves uh, assessment of their body systems as well as their cerebral function. 
an assessment of your cranial nerves in an unconscious patient is a little bit different than in your conscious patient. And page 706, table 11-5, shows you how to do cranial nerve assessment on your unconscious patient. All right, so these are your 12 cranial nerves and it kind of shows you where they are in the brain um, and then it shows you um, if they are sensory, motor, or both. If they're both, then they're going to have both a red and blue line. It also shows you um, what each nerve um, assesses. Alright, so diagnostic test. Um, You have a lot of different diagnostic tests that can be done. Um, CTs and MRIs or x-rays of the head um, with or without contrast can be done. And then it kind of goes along. Um, ultrasounds usually are used for um, your infants. And then you can see you've got EEG monitoring, um, cerebral angiography, which we've kind of talked about before, your um, Positron emission tomography, that's a PET scan. You've got nerve conduction studies, um, myelograms, it just kind of keeps going on and on. Um, monitoring electrolytes, monitoring their intracranial pressure, um, therapeutic drug levels. And so like if they're on seizure medications, that would be one of the ones that has to be monitored usually. Um, your antidiuretic hormones, um, an assessment of the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, looking at serum glucose and protein. Your interventions and therapy are going to be focusing on pro, um, preserving function and preventing deterioration. Primary interventions are going to be to maintain um, airway management, provide IV fluids as ordered, treatment protocols to reduce increased intracranial pressure, and controlling seizures. And we'll talk about these in a minute. Some of your independent um, actions are going to be ensuring airway patency and adequate ventilation, assessing their level of consciousness, monitoring their fluid intake and output, reducing environmental stimuli, making sure everything's quiet and calm, um, positioning of the client. A lot of times having the head of the bed up about 30 degrees is good. Um, seizure precautions including patting the side rails because anytime they have any kind of um, brain trauma or increased intracranial pressure that puts them at risk for seizures. Monitoring their intracranial pressure which is done in an ICU setting. Um, assessing the pupils for responses to light, and that's just doing your PERLA. Measuring their vital signs. Um, administering IV fluids as ordered. Using your hyperventilation um, to reduce intracranial pressure. And that's usually done through ventilation management. Collaboration. But a mechanical ventilation may be needed. You need to monitor ABGs. Um, Cautiousness is used with hyperventilation to reduce the um, PaCO2 levels. Need to promote cerebral vasoconstriction to reduce cerebral edema. Um, administering IV fluids. Nutrition for your patients with long-term alterations and level of consciousness, such as the persistent vegetative state, locked-in syndrome, um, intral Feedings with a gastrostomy tube is the preferred method if they can't get enough orally in. Um, parental uh, nutrition, like with TPN, is needed in some cases. Looking at fluid management, an IV catheter is going to be inserted and the use of isotonic or slightly hypertonic solutions may be needed. That's going to be normal saline or lactated ringers. Hyponatremia. They will give ferrosamide or mannitol given to promote water excretion. And so if we can get the water out, then usually um, the sodium levels will come out, will come back up. Pharmacologic therapies for seizures, they will use anti-epileptic um, drugs 
They are used to reduce or control most seizure activity. You need to make sure you're protecting your client from injury in case of a seizure. You may need to try several medications um, to, make, to get the one that works best for the patient to control their seizures. A lot of time a combination of drugs may be needed to help control the seizures. Status epilepticus is, requires immediate intervention. Make sure that you establish and maintain an airway. Um, IV of 50% dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia. Um, diazepam or lorazepam IV is given to stop seizures. Phenytoin IV is given for long-term co um, control of seizures. Phenobarbital may also be given. For increased intracranial pressure, your diuretics such as mannitol and furosemide are used. Sedation and paralysis are chemical restraints um, that are used to control uh, restlessness and agitation because those can both um, lead to increased intracranial pressure. Your antipyretics are used to treat hyperthermia. They can also use cooling blankets to um, decrease the temperature. Anticonvulsants for seizures. GI prophylaxis with IV histamine H2 antagonist or proton pump inhibitors are used to um, treat uh, stress gastritis and ulcers. IV fluids are used to maintain fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Your vasoactive medications help to maintain their mean arterial pressure while minimizing increases to intracranial pressure and then TPN if enteral feeding is not possible. And then this concludes the um, concept of intracranial pressure. If you have questions, let me know and I'll try to help clarify.